and Jagger, the Grandmasters. Sometimes if you're lost, the best way to be found is to retrace your steps back, like Hansel and Gretel. The question is, did you leave little breadcrumbs? And the truth is, you did. You just don't realize it. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is very deep, but very meaningful. If it is true, as all the great yogic masters and Christ and Buddha taught, that the reality of the fact is that you are God, that that is your nature, you are of divine nature, and you are indeed the Father and I are one, as Christ put it, or Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahma, Soham, I am He. Those are the great mantras. So, let's be honest, which one do you feel that? Which one of you even understand how that can be? Because I'm just this piddly little human trying to get by, trying to not hurt too much, trying to find some security, trying to find some peace. That doesn't sound like God. So what happened? What's the gap? So the first question is, is it true that right now I and you are God. Not someday will be that, not might find your way back, might not have some experience, that literally what you are, who you are, is the absolute divine force. Well, wait a minute, the divine force is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. In other words, it's present everywhere. It's conscious, aware of everything, and it's of all power. There's no power but that power. Is that who we're talking about that you are? Yes. <laughs> Let's get it started. That's who you are. When? Now. Okay. Then I must be really lost because that's not my experience in life. So the question is, why? What happened? Believe it or not, that is what is attempted in parable, in allegory, to be taught as the fall from the garden. So we'll start off by what is the nature of the divine infinite one? In yoga philosophy and the yoga teachings, all the way back to the Upanishads, the Puranas, and with all the great masters who reached these great states which we call enlightenment, have said is that the nature of the infinite, divine, omnipresent one is ecstasy. Not judgment, not punishment, not heaven and hell, just pure satchitananda, eternal, conscious ecstasy. In other words, at all times, it's pure, overwhelming ecstasy. We're everywhere. For how long? Eternity? Will it ever be otherwise? No. Okay, I'm not challenging you. And what is taught, and it's true, is that's what you are right now. So let's start with, it's not what you experience. We have insecurities and jealousies and fears and anxieties. What happened? That is what they are attempting to explain to you as the fall from the garden. If you were and are in absolute ecstasy, total well-being, completely whole and complete within yourself, you need nothing. You're just playing. It's just a ex- divine dance, a divine sport. That's what life is. That's what you're doing every second. You're enjoying every moment of it. It's not that you're not living on this plane as well as being everywhere. You're just playing everywhere, in the galaxies and on Earth and in your job and in your children and your family and as far off as all the nebula and so on. You're all of that. It's not that you're not living your life. That's the truth. What happened? How did I get down here? Because that's what I am? How did I get down here? I like it better up there. How about you? That sounds like much more fun. And you're not giving anything up. You're still playing down here. It's like a sport. You can have fun with a sport. You can arbitrarily draw 10-yard lines and this and that and then take a ball, oval-shaped or whatever, egg-shaped, and start throwing around and make up some rules. If you do it this way, you get in trouble. You can have fun. Why would you do that on the planet Earth? Just to have fun. I mean, why else would you do such a thing? You're just having fun. It's just you go play. You just have fun. There's all kinds of things you can do down here. If you're okay inside 
and you're filled with Satchitananda, eternal ecstasy and bliss and inspiration and beauty, and that's all that's pouring off of you, have fun. Go chase a little ball and try to get into a hole where there's a flag. To me, if you want to play golf and you want to get a low score, pick up the ball and drop it in the hole. But no, there are rules. Hey, well, there are rules everywhere, aren't there? Stop at red lights, go on green lights. And like, they're just filled with rules. It's a game. It's play. It's just the divine being playing. So it's not that you give anything up to be God. It's just you get to have everything. Everything. Human life, divine life, every single thing all at the same time. That is the nature of your being. All right, so let's start with, excuse me, sir, that's not what I experience every day. In fact, I've never experienced it. (laughs) Okay, that's what people say. I don't know that that's the truth, and it's nice of you to tell us that. Okay, so what happened? Let's start off with, the Bible says, man was created in the image of God, doesn't it? Man was created in the image of God. Well, all you know is this thing, the world you're living in now. So God must be neurotic, have a lot of anxiety, and worry about everything, because that's what man is. So if man was creating the image of God, it must be like that. No, I told you, that would be God is creating the image of man. That's what it says. So what part of me am I missing? If you tell me that right now, you are that infinite, everything, Satchitananda, that's what it is, that's your experience. Well, why don't I experience that? We're going to explain that. So we start with, who are you that is creating the image of God? And we went through that the other day, so I'm going to do it very quickly. In fact, I'll skip the low-level stuff, right? Ultimately, who you are is consciousness. What do you mean? You are aware of things. If things are happening and you're not aware of them, they're not happening. Not to you, anyways. So the essence of your being is awareness. The most important thing in your whole life is awareness. Why? How do I know that? If I take away your husband or wife, take away your job, you know what happened. You're aware. You're a conscious being. What if I turn off your consciousness? If you're not conscious, you're not there. It doesn't matter what else is happening because you're not aware of it. Therefore, that is the core, the essence, the root of your being is consciousness. So if somebody says to you, who are you? And you say, I'm my husband's wife. You're lying. I'm the one that's aware that I married that guy. You are the awareness that these experiences came into your consciousness. If you take the experience away, you're still you. If you didn't marry that person, you marry somebody else or don't get married. It's still you having the experience, isn't it? So you are not what happened to you. You are the one that experienced what happened to you. You would still be there if it didn't happen to you. It was raining real hard the other day. I was in the rain. I couldn't see. I was so scared. That's who you are. In other words, if that didn't happen, you wouldn't exist. No, of course I would exist. I would just be having a different experience. Who would? I can't say this enough to you. This is the essence of understanding what spirituality and spiritual growth is about. You are defining yourself as an experience you're having. I was the sick one. No, you experienced being sick. I was pregnant. No, You experience being pregnant. The consciousness, we've got to finally get this down to be able to go further. The consciousness is the essence of what is defined as you. How do I know that? In scientific experiments, we take one variable out and put it back in, take another one out and try to see what change took place, right? I can take out anything that happened in your entire life and you would still be there. You would sit there and say, I had this experience. Well, what if you didn't? Well, I'd have a different one. You're the person that's experiencing things. If I take away the experiencer, the consciousness, the awareness, whatever that is, you know you have that, don't you? Are you aware? I should have started right there. Are you aware in there? How do you know? Just don't even answer me. (laughs) Okay? Like if I ask, are you in there? I don't know you. Are you in there? Yes, I'm in there. What does that mean? It means I'm aware that you asked the question, and I'm aware that I heard it, and I'm aware that I'm in here, doesn't it? That is the essence of your being. That's the whole problem, is we're not paying attention to the core, to the root of our being. That is what was created in the image of God. That's what they're talking about, that you were created in the image of God. But let's get you straight. You're not the one who's wearing the glasses. You're the one who knows that you're wearing the glasses, and I just talked about them. Your awareness That's the essence of your being. is consciousness, awareness. Everything else is something you're aware of. 
Okay, fine. So let's say we understand that. You should understand that. Well, you were aware when you were 10 years old. Maybe you don't remember, but when you were little, you cried. You wanted food. How do you know? How do you know you're hungry? How do you know you're sad? How do you know you wanted a toy? You're throwing a tantrum. How do you know you want that toy? Because I'm conscious. I saw it. So I'm an aware being. Just put that aside for a moment. That is what's back there. Awareness of being. Everything else is experiences you're having. We went through this before. One, you have experiences outside. Those are not the only experiences you have. You have experiences inside. What do you mean? Thoughts. Do you have thoughts? Do you know that you have thoughts? Do you know you have emotions? These are still just things that you're aware of. You are the consciousness, the awareness of being. You're aware of the outside world. You're aware of the sensations and experience of having a body. And you're aware of thoughts and you're aware of emotions. The awareness is the one common thing. It's the root of your being. It's consciousness, awareness. All right. So what does it mean to become enlightened? It means to return your consciousness to the seat of consciousness. Instead of your consciousness being involved in what's going on out there or being involved in what's going on in your thoughts or being involved in what's going on in your emotions, you're involved in being conscious. That sounds weird. What does that mean? In the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which most people never read, and that's fine, but that's supposed to be the essence of yoga, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. He sits there and explains that there's one state of meditation or, or contemplation, whatever you want to call it, when you sit down and try to meditate, we'll call it that, and that is you withdraw your awareness of the senses, pratyahara. You withdraw your awareness of the senses. What does that mean? Your consciousness is aware of what comes in through your senses. Does it have to be? You know it doesn't have to be. What happens when you go to sleep? Can somebody walk in the room and talk to you? While you're fast asleep and you have no awareness of what's going on because you're aware of your dreams or you're aware of deep sleep. So there, that's pratyahara. It's just not willful. It's not while you're aware of being conscious in this state, the state of the conscious mind, you can't withdraw from your senses. Everything distracts you, pulls you out. But you obviously are capable. Everybody is capable of withdrawing their consciousness from their senses. You do it every single night when you fall asleep. Well, if I can't fall asleep, then you didn't do it. You're sitting there listening and thinking and doing all that stuff, all right? So the first step to come back to the seat of consciousness is you have to withdraw from your senses. Why? Because the senses pull your consciousness down to them. It's called distraction. Things happen outside and you distract your consciousness so that it pays attention. Look at the words. Consciousness, paying attention, being distracted. These are all very deep spiritual words because you're talking about consciousness, Maybe you were thinking, and then something happened, and you're not thinking anymore. It distracted your consciousness. Wherever your consciousness is, on your thoughts, on your emotions, in the world, it can get distracted, can't it? Pratyahara, you withdraw your awareness, your consciousness, from its addiction or distraction from the senses. Like I said to you, don't make that sound like that's some high yogic state that none of you will ever get to. You do it every single night. And that neat? Don't you? You withdraw from your senses. Are you conscious while you're asleep? Just sit with her for a second. Well, we have a little evidence. Do you dream? How do you know? How do you know you dreamed? You wake up in the morning. You say, oh my God, it's an amazing dream. I know you want to tell me about it, but first I have to ask you a question. How do you know? What do you mean, how do I know? I was there. You were. Are you conscious when you watch your dream? Yes. Your consciousness withdrew from your senses and started paying attention to your subconscious mind or your superconscious mind. When I'm talking about the levels of dreams. But it started to pay attention to what's going on in your dreams. How do you know? You were actually in the dream, weren't you? Do you have a dream body and you can get married and get divorced and have babies? And you really feel like you're experiencing that, don't you? Because you are. There is no difference between you, the consciousness, experiencing a dream and you experiencing this world. There is no difference the world is made of atoms, and it's doing its own thing. Your mind creates the dream, but then you're conscious of it. That's why you know what you dreamt. And you can wake up in a nightmare, can't you? You can wake up all excited. Why? Because you experience the thing. It's the same consciousness. I go through this deep in the new book, Living in Tether. It's a very simple question. When you wake up, I like that one moment, all right? You wake up, and you had a dream. And I want you to hear your words. Listen to them carefully. Oh my God, I had this unbelievable dream. 
I was getting married and I met somebody who was just perfect with my soulmate and I was so happy I was so happy and then I woke up and now I'm in my bed and it wasn't real how many times you used the word I you used the word I to the one that was having the dream and then you used the word I as the one who woke up why because it was the same you it's the same consciousness you better write your dream down in dream writing while you're sleeping so you can read it in the morning no I'm right there I had the dream I don't have any problem It's the same me. It is the same consciousness that is watching what the mind created. It didn't take the outside world, but the sense is sending in the experience. The mind can create an amazing world, can't it? I know it's true of me. I'm much more left brain than right brain. When I'm awake, can I create the dream world in full detail and three dimensions and everything going on in my conscious mind that I can in my dream? Not a chance. How about you? Right? Isn't it more vivid in a dream? Like a whole world shows up, right? With buildings and people and things. Can you do all that willfully when you're awake? I've met an architect that could. He just was so brave. Just bam, he'd see the whole thing. I can't do that. I don't know whether you can or not, but you understand the difference. Your mind normally is able to do amazing things while you're sleeping. And it creates all kinds of detail. Something made that world. You did. Your mind did. Believe it or not, you can learn to have that power of creativity during your waking state. Wow. And that's not what I'm stressing. What I'm stressing is that you are conscious. It's the same you, the same awareness that when I say, are you in there, that is watching the dream. And then it comes back and it remembers the entire dream. And it doesn't just remember it. It experienced it. You can have thoughts in your dream. I was having this dream that my mind started bothering me. Wait a minute. I thought your mind was making the dream. Pretty dynamic, isn't that? The main point is there's only one you in there. There's just one you in there. It's experiencing the dreams. It's experiencing the waking world through the senses. And Patanjali talks about this. What happens when I'm not dreaming and I'm asleep? When I go into a dreamless state, they call it deep sleep. Patanjali is so beautiful. This is written a long time ago. He says, when you're in deep sleep and you're not dreaming, it's not that you're not conscious. You're conscious of nothing. You're conscious of nothing. If you go into a room and there's a whole bunch of things in it, you see them. If it gets absolutely pitch black, you can't see anything, you're still there, aren't you? That's what Patanjali says. The deep sleep, consciousness gets a real rest. It doesn't have to be distracted by the senses, and it doesn't have to be distracted by the dreams that the mind is creating. Therefore, it can settle back. Believe it or not, Yogananda called that state a semi-superconscious state. Why? Because the consciousness is not being bound by anything personal. There's no personal thoughts being created in your mind. There's no senses and outside world. Therefore, there's complete deep peace. You sometimes have woken up and said to somebody, oh my God, I slept so deep last night. I love your words. I slept so deep last night, I didn't dream at all. How do you know? Because you were conscious. This sense of being is who you are. And it goes through all these different stages, doesn't it? Okay, so now that's pratyahara. The ability to willfully withdraw back to that state where your consciousness is not being distracted at all by the senses. So it says withdraw your consciousness from the senses. Then the next is concentration, dharna. What does that mean? Now that I'm not distracted... By the outside, do I have to be distracted by the thoughts and the emotions? Not if I focus. That's why they have you meditate on a candle. God, we all grew up, many of us, as yogis and meditators and this and the other thing in the 60s and 70s. They meditate on a candle. What the heck does meditate on a candle have to do with God or anything? It means that your consciousness is no longer distracted by the thoughts and the emotions that are going on inside. You focused your consciousness, not on your senses, but you just focus it, and you could do it with a mantra. Let's do it inside. You're sitting there saying a mantra. Why? Because your mind normally says more things than a mantra. <laughs> How many more? Oh, I don't know, 600 billion. It's normally all over the place, isn't it? Dharna is concentration. You focus your consciousness and don't let it get distracted by emotions and thoughts and all kinds of things like that. And so by focusing and concentrating it, you have built a pathway back to consciousness because consciousness is not scattered. 
The whole key is, is consciousness being distracted by the senses? No. Pratyahara said, no, I've withdrawn my consciousness from the senses. Is it being distracted by your thoughts and emotions and all these inner things going on? No. Why? I focused it on something very focused. If it's mantra, I don't care if it's a candle. Point is, that's what it's about, which is dharana, focus. Now what happens? Those are not meditation, according to Patanjali. You're able to totally withdraw from your senses, not being disturbed by the outside at all, and you totally focus your consciousness one-pointedly. Master used to say, do it at the point between your eyebrows. It's focus. Focus everything there. Now your thoughts are not distracting you, and so on. Believe it or not, if you enter a great state of total one-pointed concentration, Patanjali says that is not meditation. That's dharana. Then there's the next stage called dhyana, which is meditation. Take the one-pointed consciousness that is focused on a single point and bring it back to the source of the consciousness. That's meditation. In other words, he calls it when you're contemplating consciousness itself. You're not contemplating something outside of consciousness. Consciousness can focus, can go out and focus and get distracted. Now you've pulled it all the way back. When consciousness doesn't leave the source of consciousness, you are in a state of deep meditation, and that's when you experience God. That's when you experience that you will create an image of God. If you touch that place for one moment, you will know for the rest of your existence that you are eternal. Consciousness cannot die. The body can die. The dreams can come and go. But the indwelling being that is aware of all that has always been and will always be. It is the beginning and end. And if you go deep enough back into that state... Then, I'll use Mayor Baba's words, a fully enlightened avatar. He said when he first dropped back into that state, it was like the point of his consciousness, where his consciousness was coming from, was a point. It was looking out. Now it wasn't looking out. And that point, that drop of consciousness, dropped behind and fell into the ocean of consciousness and merged. The word yoga means that. It means union. That your individual consciousness, the Atman, falls back into the Paramatman. That's what it means, man was created in the image of God. We have a lot more to talk about, but I just want to make sure we lay the groundwork. Therefore, that's who you are. If you're conscious, that's who you are. That is the source of your consciousness. Normally, and I love that you want to hear about it, but you can't even normally contemplate that. Why? Because your consciousness is so scattered by being distracted by your vision, your hearing, your taste, your touch. Oh, my God, the smell, <laughs> right? It just is totally out here, isn't it? It fell from that inner state of oneness down into this. That is the fall from the garden. But the garden is still there. It didn't leave. It just got distracted. And that's why I sit there and teach. The great ones teach belief in God means nothing. I mean, it does mean something as opposed to, you know, going out there and causing trouble. What is believing in God? It's a mental thought. It's mind. You can believe and not believe, can't you? Just change your mind. Versus experiencing your divinity, that's yoga. That's what that's about. You experience that. Ramakrishna is a very, very great soul, fully enlightened. He had a disciple, Vivekananda, who was just a schoolboy, and he was being taught in a Western school in India. And basically, he decided he didn't believe in all these gurus and all these saints of India. And he went from ashram to ashram to ashram to ashram, very intellectually with his friends, and would ask whoever was teaching, yes, but have you known God? And the person would say, well, I'm teach of him. No, not to teach of him. Are you a knower of God? And he put them publicly right on the spot. And they all said, no. I've had experiences, I've studied, I've read the Gita inside and out. And he went to see Ramakrishna, and he asked him, have you seen God? Are you a knower of God? And Ramakrishna turned to him and said, he is more real to me now than you or anything else in this room. How could he say that? He was so far gone, seated in this state of absolute oneness, that he, Ramakrishna, once said to a disciple, you know how you see ghosts in your world? Every once in a while, people say they kind of float in etheric type things, right? That's how I see your world. It's pure blinding light everywhere I look. And every once in a while, what you call a building seems to take shape. So we're talking about very high stuff, aren't we? All right. The trouble is, it's not high stuff. It's who you are. You are right now that infinite consciousness distracted by you. 
distracted by your thoughts, your emotions, and you're really hung up on those senses, aren't you? Okay, so one, how did I get there? And two, how do I get back? Because it's the same road. If you understand how you got lost and trace it back, it leads to the same place. So how did I get lost? One thing that I haven't ever talked about, I haven't talked about it, I guess I used to once in a while, but somebody asked me a question after Sunday service, and I could see that they were struggling with it. And the question they asked was, if my consciousness is God, and it is, that's the nature of, of God, Shichakti, conscious energy, well then, how can it fall? How can it get lost? How can it be bad? I don't understand. If it's perfect, how can it lose its perfection? So let's talk about that. Consciousness has a quality, and that quality is awareness. And that awareness, like a spotlight, can fall on objects. The thoughts are an object. Emotions are an object. Everything that comes into your senses are objects. Consciousness illumines those, becomes aware of those. But consciousness has another quality. That is, it has the ability, and not just the ability, it will tend to identify with what it fell upon. And that's the whole key. This thing in biology, they call it imprinting. Remember that word? When an animal bonds to another animal? And, and sometimes a little duck could bond to a goat. <laughs> it's amazing. Whatever they see and hang out with, all of a sudden, that's mommy. Okay? And it's, yes, you all heard of that? Bonding and imprinting. That's very deep. That's a very important thing to understand if you want to understand the fall from the garden. So what happens is you're born. You don't know squat. Even in the womb, you don't get many experiences. Sometimes people say they heard something in the womb, but it's quite dark in there. It's kind of quiet and nice, right? But even just taking it from birth, when you drop out, it's lights, cameras, action. And psychologists know that, right? It's just Bam! All of a sudden, everything's coming to the senses. There's noise, there's sound. You freak. That's a complete sensory overload. What you're trying to do is orient yourself. That baby is conscious. But what's it conscious of? It doesn't have its thoughts pulled together. It doesn't understand everything or anything. If you got amnesia, and all of a sudden you came to, but you have total amnesia, are you feeling very peaceful and calm? You are freaked out. That is as much of a freak out as can ever happen. You don't know who you are. You don't know where you came from. You don't know anything. Just complete amnesia. Can you imagine how scary that would be? It's scarier than anything. You think you're scared if your husband leaves you, your wife leaves you. Everything left you. You don't even know anything. You've never experienced anything before. They go into panic. All right? The child dropped down, or you dropped down into this world. You are lost. Why do you think they cry? You are lost. Don't you go to some romantic thing here. You don't have any idea which side is up. You don't know who's who. You don't know nothing. And it's just all of a sudden as if you had total amnesia. You have dropped down here and you are in trouble. You panic. And what are you going to do? You're going to try and imprint. You are going to try and get some form of stability. Even the little duck did it and did it to a goat. And that neat that we can look at even the biological instincts of wanting to grab. Buddhists call it clinging. There's the ultimate clinging. The first thing I see, mind. Isn't it beautiful? So basically, your consciousness doesn't know where to rest. It's not seated in God consciousness. If you ever had a kid, you're going to know it's not seated in God consciousness. Terrible twos, etc., etc. Don't you dare think that's a pure being and it just dropped down and it's God and we screwed it up. Nah. The consciousness is completely lost. I mean, unless you're Christ, born fully enlightened, born the king of angels. I mean, it can't happen. The great masters talk about that, that they are fully aware when they come out. Yogananda, listening to his autobiography again, he says that he was frustrated as a baby because he couldn't talk. He was fully clear. He knows what he wanted to say. And he just it was so frustrated to have to be caught inside this body. But he was an enlightened master. He's a great being. But that's not us. So you drop down. You're completely lost. And what are you going to do? And I'm talking about you. Now I'm talking about you, the consciousness. So it's not by saying because it's conscious, it should be God. It lost itself. It lost its connection. It didn't lose its connection to God. It's just looking out instead of in. The connection's still there. It's there right now. 
So basically, remember, we had to work our way from through the senses, through the mind, back to self. Okay? Well, that's not what naturally happens, is it? What naturally happens is we're distracted. So all these noises and sounds and lights and things and everything pull our consciousness out. Therefore, we have left the seat of God. But you're still connected, just like every ray that leaves the sun is connected to the sun, isn't it? Those beams are coming off the sun. They're still connected to the sun. They fall down on earth and illumine things, but they're still connected to the sun. But we're only paying attention to what they illumine. You know, paying attention to the rays that came all the way down. Same thing happens with consciousness. So it gets pulled out down into this world and it freaks out. Okay, so what happens next? It tries to find stability. That's called building a self-concept. A concept is something that's not real. Do you have a concept of what an apple tastes like? Either you taste the one or not, and if you're making it up, I don't want to hear what you have to say. That's what a concept is, something you make up in your mind. Go look up what a concept means. It doesn't mean reality. It means a concept of reality. So you've made up in your mind what an apple tastes like because of different experience you had not eating an apple, and you made up in your mind who you are. That's what a self-concept is. I don't know who I am. I'm in a state of complete panic. So mummy, daddy, crib, go ask some psychologist what it would be like if every single night you put the baby in a different crib with different colors and different toys. Go on, do it every night. And also have different people go in and act like mommy and daddy. You are not going to have a healthy human being because they didn't have the opportunity to develop a self-concept. And they were completely lost. And so they couldn't grab on. They couldn't bond. And so basically, that's not what happens normally to us. We normally have at least a stable enough environment, mommy, daddy, and you know wherever we sleep. And therefore, we develop the self-concept. I tell you right now, probably if you took a baby that was used to sleep in a crib and you took him to a different crib, he'd cry. And send somebody else in and act like mommy, he'd cry. Because they bonded. That's what imprinting is. They imprinted to their environment. Well, imprinting to a human being is developing a self-concept. It's something they develop within the mind of mine. That's the beginning of mine, okay? So I want you to see little ducks chasing a goat. Mine, mine, mommy, mommy. (laughs) So basically, we did that, didn't we? And we imprinted, and we developed a self-concept. All right, now what? The panic, I don't like telling you this. The panic is still back there. You don't know who you are. You're just defining yourself. That's why every moment of your life, you're redefining yourself. He used to tell the story. Somebody walks up to you and says, oh my God, you look so good in those glasses. You should be a model. Have you ever seen anyone look as good as she does in a pair of glasses? That's just amazing, all right? Okay, well, how you feel? Oh, I'm a glasses lady, all right? Now, all of a sudden, he's going to come in here saying, oh my God, take those glasses off. They're disgusting. They are not. I look good in the glasses. I, 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 I. You imprint on it immediately. You make it part of your self-concept. I'm the one who looks good in the glasses. I'm the one that this person loves. I'm the one that tried to get pregnant three times and I had miscarriages, but finally I had a baby. That's who I am, is it? No, that's what happened to you. And that's what imprinting is, is you had experiences outside, went outside through your senses. They came in through your senses. They're not you. You're the one that's having the experience. But you go there because of the panic, because of the fear, because of the lostness, what do you mean lost? You left God. You left the universe. You left Satchitananda. You left eternal conscious ecstasy. That's the nature of your being. And something way deep inside, way deep inside knows it. And it's looking for it. And so it grabs onto whatever it can get its hands on. And then as you grow up, I want a nicer car. And I want a nicer this. And I want to look good. I want people to respect me. Self-concept, self-concept, self-concept. You never stopped. You do it every day. You do it all the time. Just grab, 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 grab. And then if something doesn't match your self-concept, you cry. That's not necessarily like a baby cries. You just hit somebody or yell at them or freak out. Just have somebody treat you the way you don't like to be treated and tell me what your day is like. Tell me how you behave. That's because you built this thing in your mind. That's the primal thing you did with your mind is you built a self-concept, which is just a thought pattern. They're just thought patterns. And when things come in from the outside world and they hit those thought patterns where you're hiding, it's your mask. Somebody wants to ask Yogananda. They didn't need to be able to go to an enlightened master and ask questions. They asked him a question. Master, what is ego? Whoa, I'd like to hear the answer. What is ego? He said, ego is the masquerading self. The ego is the masquerading self. What does that mean? 
you pull the mask around yourself because you don't know who you are. So you said, this is who I am. You took experiences that came into your senses and said, I'm these experiences. I did this, I did that, I married so and so, I did this, and I'm the one who got divorced. Ay, 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 You built the self-concept of I, me, and mine. And so now it is the masquerading self. I love that. Let's sit with that for a second. This is what I just taught you. The self is back here, conscious, but it's freaked. Well, somebody asked, well, how could God be freaked? Because he looked away from himself. The consciousness looked out, away from the seat of consciousness, and got lost. That's what it means about a lost soul. It's lost. But it doesn't mean it's not still connected, but it's looking in the wrong direction. And so it's looking out. And because it looks out, it's lost, and it panics, and then it grabs everything that happens to it, and it builds all these thought patterns, called what I like and what I don't like and who I am. And then what you do is you devote your life to your ego. You devote your life to your self-concept. These are the places where I hid myself, all through my life, now the outside better match that. People better treat me the way I think I should be treated. People better relate to me the way I should be related to. If I think I'm the best violinist that ever walked the face of the earth and people boo at me when I play, no, that's not okay. People, get away, go away. You know what you're talking about. We all argue, <laughs> no, we, all right, so beautiful. And so now you try to create a world out here that matches what you built inside to be the masquerading self, to hide yourself. And if it matches, how you doing? Ooh, if it doesn't match, how you doing? And so you build this mask around the self, and now you're going out, acting. Your, everything you do in the world is to try to support what you built inside so you don't have to feel the panic. Well, what's that panic? Have you ever felt the panic? Has anything ever happened in your life that threw you back into that panic so you realize it's pretty freaking scary in there and you did everything you could to fight back and... Yes or no? All right, every one of you have. That's what's back there. I told you once. I read the Bible once in my life in 1972. I thought it was kind of neat. But I was running into yoga. And so a lot of it meant a lot more to me than it does to a lot of people. What I think is neat, and I didn't read that till I was getting ready for Passover. We used to do a lot of Passovers out here. And I was with my daughter when she was young. And we were going through the Old Testament, Genesis and this and that, because related to the Passover service. And I read something that I'll never forget. It said, when God threw man out of the garden, he told him, you will have to suffer through childbirth, yes, and also you have to work by the sweat of your brow in order to be okay. I just told you why that happened, because you built a self-concept, and now everything has to match the self-concept. Why would the world match you? <laughs> You're just this little tiny box in the middle of the whole universe. You had nothing to do with the creation of the universe. You have nothing to do with the creation of what's going on around you. There's 800 billion quillion things going on, and you have control over three. And now you're going to sweat it. You'll sweat it to make sure it be the way you want. That's what's meant by your work with the sweat of your brow. And then he said, now you listen to me. Then God took a cherubim, that's an angel, took a cherubim with a flaming sword and set it at the east gate of the garden, lest man try to come back into the garden and taste the tree of eternal life instead of just the tree of self-knowledge. That, to a yogi, to someone who's gone through this process of working their way back, you might as well talk in English. That cherubim with the flaming sword, ever notice it's in there? Ever notice what your heart can feel like when you're trying to let go and catch fire? And it can be hot in there, can't it? And you don't want to go any further. You come back out here. Get away from me. There, he just kept you out of the garden, didn't he? And how do you really know it? When you go to the other side of that, and all of a sudden there's all this ecstasy and all this love and all this light and all this peace. It's called piercing the fourth chakra, piercing these layers of your personal self. It's what Christ called dying to be reborn. Isn't that neat that it's actually true that Genesis is so symbolic? Nobody except someone who grew so deeply knows what it's talking about. It's actually telling the truth. Well, why would it be? How would Genesis, do you all know where Genesis came from? How did it say what it said about things like that? Anybody remember? Moses, during Exodus, set up a tabernacle, a tent, outside. It was after the golden calf stuff. So he left the community. He didn't want to be in the community anymore. So he set this little tent out there, and they said, spirals of light. Both Aaron and Moses were in the tent. Spirals of light came down every night 
bright, brilliant light. The people that are still in the camps said they were blinded. They couldn't look. It was just panels of light. And that's where Moses wrote. The five books of Moses came from that. They came from just passed straight down from a higher source. And that's where Genesis was written. And the, the people in the camp, when Moses would come out of the tent every night, he'd stand there. They couldn't look at him. They said he was shining so bright. There was so much light coming off him that they just looked down at the ground in front of him. I'm not telling you you have to believe all this stuff, but it's pretty neat that it talked about this cherubim with a flaming sword at the east gate of the garden, keeping man out lest he get back in to taste the fruit of eternal life as he did the tree of self-knowledge. Let's just take that one for a second. I thought knowledge was a good thing. Why is this being talked about as a bad thing? Self-knowledge. In other words, all of a sudden, you know yourself as this body. You know yourself as this little person like that. That's the self-knowledge that you tasted this tree of. In other words, all of a sudden, Adam, it's funny, I, I'm not into this stuff, but it's fun to talk about, right? Adam, remember God's walking around the garden? Adam, where are you? Adam, I'm hiding. How do you hide from God? You're doing a real good job. You hide from God by looking in the opposite direction, by looking at you, self, personal self, self self-knowledge. You thought you were this. I want a mother to please. I'd rather do it myself. You develop this personal being. And all of a sudden, Adam says what? Here am I. And God says, what the heck is around your waist? A fig leaf? I put a fig leaf on a tree. What's it doing around your waist? What did he say? I was naked. Do you understand how deep that is? In other words, you, your consciousness is now so identified with this. Dogs are naked. Cats are naked. They don't wear fig leaves. Monkeys are naked. All animals are naked. But they don't know they're naked because they're not caught up in themselves. They don't have an ego. They don't have a self-concept. Go on. Take somebody, take you naked, and put you out in the middle of the plaza. Ah! You fucking, you try, you're called a traumatic experience. Dogs and cats don't have a traumatic experience. <laughs> it's because you identified with yourself not as the self, as God. And he sat there and said to God, I was naked. And God said, well, how do you know you're naked? All right? Because you fell from the ground. You all seen it? All right? It ties together really beautifully, doesn't it? So you have fallen down because of the panic, that hot stuff back there that you don't want to touch it in a million years, do you? You do every single thing you can to not go into those places. And what does it mean? Do everything to keep yourself distracted out here, making it match your self-concept so that you're okay. And that's what psychology teaches you, how to cope with the fact that you're not so well inside, but at least be a productive part of society. Well, yoga doesn't teach you that. Yoga says, all right, if that's how you fell down, let's get back. How do you do that? Well, we can start with not being so distracted by everything that you think you need in order to be okay. It means to start to let go. And those are the teachings you get, right? You start to let go. Renounce? No. It has nothing to do with renunciation. Renunciation is saying, I'm down, I'm lost, I don't feel what I need to feel, I think that will give it to me, but I'm not going to do it. It's not about suppression, it's not about renunciation, it's about sitting there saying, how did I get so lost? I have felt beauty inside, haven't you? You know, some beautiful experience, the sunset. There's beauty in there, but you keep getting distracted. You see a beautiful, beautiful sunset. You say, it blew me away. It blew my mind. I like that. It blew my mind. All right, why'd you come back? Was it nice? Yeah. Well, why'd you come back? You came back one second later. You just drove away, right? Because you get distracted and pulled down because your self-concept is pulling you into it. You can't get away from it. It talks all the time, tells you what you have to do, what you don't have to do, what you want and what you don't want. You won't be happy if that happens. You better keep this person liking you because they're the meaning of your life. They are not the meaning of your life. I'm sorry to tell you. You know, the meaning of your life is coming back to the garden. I was that 60, so I got to find our way back to the garden. All right, Woodstock. You are and you can and nothing you ever did will keep you from there. It's just that you built this self-concept that is so powerful between your id, your ego, and your superego, your guilt and this and then shame. Isn't guilt and shame really spiritual? No, they're not spiritual. There's just another place to get caught. There's another place to pull you down. But I did wrong things. When, when I was little, when I was five, how old are you now? 65. You need to learn how to let go. 
So you start working the, the amount of time, but living on tether goes very deep into that. It builds all this. Don't start with the hard stuff. Don't start with problems you have and what you did and divorces and car accidents. Please don't. Don't do that. Start with the simple stuff. Can you handle the fact that it's hot out today? Can you handle the fact that the driver in front of you is not driving the way you want? Can you handle the fact that somebody said something, at least I think they did, that might have been insulted? I'm not sure that I heard them right. Come on. You're trying to cause problems for yourself? Let go. Start letting go. Let go. You hear me? Even if somebody said something and it was insulting, they had a bad day. You give them a break. What are you going to carry it with you and never see them again and never talk to them again? People write me that way sometimes. Something happened, I never want to see them again or go anywhere. So, what are you doing? Handle it. Handle it. What do you mean to handle it? It hurt. It stirred up this stuff back in there. It challenged my self concept. Good. Let it go. Now, I'm not going to get into that tonight. If you want to read the book, read the book. Let it go. Why? Because as you let go of that stuff, you have a chance to drift back into the deeper part of your being. When you're busy clinging and grabbing and controlling and manipulating because you can't handle things, you don't stand much of a chance. So you start with the little stuff and you keep letting go. Then you start to work with your mind. Don't fight with it. Never fight with your mind. Just once in a while, notice, is that worth thinking about? Was that really worth thinking about what happened 23 years ago and whether I should have said that or not and everybody involved is dead? What is that? Why am I doing that? You watch your diet, watch what you're feeding your mind, and you start learning to let go. And I'm telling you, as you do, things start to rise up. You start to feel a little lighter. You start to feel a little higher. Of course you do, because you're not out there grabbing and clinging and freaking out and worrying. Work on yourself. And eventually what will happen is you will get to a point where you've let go enough of this ego. You're going to have an ego, but you don't have to devote yourself to it. You don't have to sit there and say, the only way I can ever be happy is to find the person that loves me the way I want to be loved, the way George did before he left me, on and on and on and on. And then you're basically driving yourself crazy in this world. You can't have a good day <laughs> unless everything's exactly what you want. You can sit there and say, okay, I've got an ego. You Believe me, you got an ego, right? I'm not talking about egos like these big egotists. You got an ego. You have a self-concept. And if things go the way you like, you feel good. If things don't go the way you like, you feel bad. Start letting go. Start letting go a little bit. Start enjoying things the way they are. Start letting go of things that aren't exactly the way you want. You do it all the time. You get served dinner and it's not heated the way you want or it's not the size you want. Just start saying, okay, it's okay. I'd rather enjoy my lunch than complain about it. And just start letting go, letting go. It starts peeling off and peeling off. And what's going to happen is you're going to start to find yourself seated deeper inside. You start to notice your thoughts instead of be your thoughts. You start to notice your ego and how much trouble it causes, that voice inside your head, as opposed to being that. Just do it gradually. Don't rush. It's okay. Just relax. Just relax. Don't fight and don't renounce and don't think you're doing anything wrong. Just be conscious and let go of the stuff that's not worth messing with. And you're going to go up and then eventually I'll close it down. You're going to feel an energy that starts to flow inside of you. It's called Shakti. It could be called spirit. It could be called chi. In yoga, we call it Shakti. And it's going to start to flow up inside of you. And you can start to be happier than you used to be. Why? Because you're not making yourself unhappy. Right? You're not in there bothering yourself all the time. And so all of a sudden, this energy starts to flow up. And you just follow it up. You follow it up. And eventually, you will be at a point where things start to happen that are bigger. And maybe your heart starts to hurt. Or you start to get oh, scared, nervous for no reason. And then remember the cherubim. Because you have to pass through that flaming sword, okay? And start to say, good, good. That's where I want to go. That's a yogi or a yogini. That's where I want to go. I don't want to waste my life hiding from myself. I don't want to waste my life trying to make everything be the way I need it to be so I can be relatively okay and then worry that it'll change. I want to explore. I want to meet that cherubim. I want to see it full force, and I want to be able to sit there and say, bring it on. That's how you deal with that chair. Bring it on. Show me your worst. If your heart hurts, you know what you say to your heart? You don't say, what can I do? You say, come on, you can do better than that. Hit me with your best. I don't want to be afraid of you anymore. I don't want to be afraid of, you know, you're afraid of your own heart. I don't want to be afraid of your own mind. No, I don't want to walk around like that. And you just keep building, building and releasing. Get strength and let go. Don't worry, you won't be presented with anything that's bigger than what you can handle. That's how it works. But it will pull you in and just you don't run away. 
You just dare to let go, dare to let go. And eventually you'll pass through that hot fire in your heart. And all of a sudden you'll be in this place of just love and light and beauty and more than you've ever felt before. You can still come out here and share it, but you're not doing things to try to get something. You're now filled with love and joy and light and it's fun. And you come out here and share, all right? You can get married and have children. It has nothing to do with it. And so basically it starts to become really beautiful and eventually it will come back high enough and your whole life will change direction. Instead of trying to get out there what you need, you're going to find I need to let go of what I used to do. I need to die to be reborn. I need to let go of this person that limits me into this tiny little cage of the personal. And you'll start to feel it pulling you up. It pulls you up like a vacuum. Vacuum cleaner pulling you up into it. And you have to learn to let go. And it's very deep. And then basically you can explore the higher states and you realize you were always there. It was you that was coming down here and doing all that. You don't need to do it anymore. And you'll become a knower of God. You'll know what it means. Man was created in the image of God. All right. We followed the breadcrumbs back up, didn't we? Work on these things. When they say now the meaning of your life is God realization, do you understand? All of your life will take you there. Jaggered it.